Good morning, everyone. Um, just to start us out, there will not be a separate scripture reading in English because that was a long passage. Rather, as you've noticed, I, over time, I always try to read the whole passage when I'm preaching, if possible, just to because the whole the word is the thing we're trying to get out to everybody. And so, I'm just going to read it throughout the passage rather than reading it all again in English um, to save a little bit of time. So. Sorry to disappoint any of you if you wanted the whole thing in English. Um, and with that said, I am also very excited to be here um, this first week. Uh, we praise God um, that you voted positively to call us to serve with you. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we're excited to get to grow to know this congregation even more and to be able to serve you. So um, yeah, thank you. And we're excited. Um, And uh, along those lines, just keep in mind that if you had voted the other way, this would have been a really <laughs> awkward Sunday because, like, I was scheduled to preach anyway. But, <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, but it, it would have been fine. We would have preached anyway. I'm happy to preach. I preach other places where I'm not a pastor, so that's, that's good. So there was no pressure, really. You know. um, but we do trust God with our futures, and we're looking forward to continuing to minister with you. Now, looking at this passage in Exodus. This is probably one of the most famous passages in the Bible, so I'm, I feel very privileged to be able to preach it to you. Um, it is probably one of the most epic and iconic stories in the Bible. Like, I, I think probably anyone who has hardly ever read the Bible has at least heard of the crossing of the sea. Um, and then we've all seen, you know, the, f the movies and the, the famous pictures and like the children's stories and the people going through and these massive curving walls of water as the people are essentially walking through in a tunnel. Uh, and how realistic some of those pictures really are, what it really looks like, we're not really sure. Um, obviously, we've taken a lot of imaginative liberty, you know, putting together pictures of the Bible stuff anyway. But it's, it's incredibly iconic. It's incredibly powerful. And I think the thing that I've realized as I've studied this more and more this week is that it is God's ultimate setup. Um, so if you read this story, if, if, you've ever, if, if you've ever read this story, you realize that what God is doing here is showing his absolute control of a situation that seems from the outside, if you didn't have God's eye view of it, to be an uncontrolled situation. Just like much of the rest of the stories in Exodus and the plagues and everything else, God is in control and he is setting up the situation. And we all love the story where, you know, there's a hero and then there's a bad guy and the hero is, is so smart and has the, the prescience to kind of think like, if I do this and I get them to do that, then like at the end, you know, the, the big reveal is that they already plan on that and they're able to come back and kind of secure their victory. Um, and there's like only a major twist at the end, right? And, and that's what we see in this passage. Um, even in, in legal terms, you know, nowadays, like police often do these sting operations or these setups where they'll create a scenario in which like, a crime can be committed by a dangerous, violent criminal. Or, um, and, and then in, in the process of that criminal committing that crime, they will then respond and arrest them. And, and when, the, when this is done well, um, it's done legally and it just kind of provides the scenario by which the criminal goes through with their evil heart and their evil intentions to accomplish something bad. Now, on the other side of it, there are forms of setup, and we've seen some in, you know, kind of high-level news media stories lately where there's almost been the entrapment where you're almost like coercing someone to do something wrong. But we know that the God of the Bible is a good and he's a holy God, and he doesn't coerce people to do sin. He's not forcing Pharaoh to do this. Out of, out of the, the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, God provides a scenario where the Egyptians are brought in thinking that they're going to have the absolute victory, and at the last minute, in this surprise event, God's setup results in God setting up this situation for his glory so that he can secure his people, so that he can deliver them and provide them salvation through the judgment of their enemies. So as we get into it, we'll see that, that God sets up situations for his own glory to secure his people and to give them salvation through judgment. 
So as I said, I'm going to start, and I'll read this passage piecemeal. So please look at it with me as I read it. We're going to start in chapter 14 and verse 1. And this first section, I'll read through verse 9. So verse 1 through 9, we see God's setup. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pir Hahiroth, where Migdal and the, er, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, and you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will, set, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariots, and he took his army with him, and took six hundred chosen chariots and all of the other chariots of Egypt, with officers, all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pir Hahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. So the Israelites have just come out of Egypt. We learned last week that the Lord loves his people and he, widely, uh, he wisely guides them. And he's, he's created this, this appearance of a pillar of fire to direct them. It's a pillar of fire at night and cloud during the day. God is giving them light to see in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the wilderness, and he's giving them clouds to keep them cool and shaded during the day. He's providing for his people and then he's also wisely guiding them. And in this situation, he communicates to Moses, hey, I've got this idea. I'm going to lure Pharaoh out so that he never messes with you guys again. This will be your last and final salvation. The Egyptians will leave you alone from here. So as they're walking out, the Lord has this plan. And he's going to get glory over Pharaoh, humiliate him one last time, and defeat him such that he never messes with the Israelites again because they're going to be wandering for a while if you haven't read the story in advance. And as the people are wandering, they're still technically within the territory controlled by the Egyptians. So they've left where they're at, and they're heading towards this promised land, but the Lord is wisely helping steer them around conflict. And on their way, before they get out of the Egyptian territory, the Lord says, let's kind of stop. We're, we don't know the exact timeline of this, but it seems like it's been days and days, if not weeks or longer, because they, they're moving this massive caravan of people, and then they're stopping, and they're camping, and they're moving. And now, all of a sudden, he tells them, go back, turn around, head out into the middle of the desert where you're going to be cornered in, in a really weird, inconvenient, and very non-strategic location. And as this is going on, and they're in the territory of Egypt, Pharaoh sees all of the people, and, and you've got to understand that he's got to have various posts with soldiers, people manning the border, administrative control around his whole territory, and there's messages going around saying this mob of people that was leaving isn't, they're not leaving. They didn't leave yet, they're just wandering around. And so Pharaoh starts to think in his mind, wait a minute, we let all of our workers go. Like, they're just, they're gone now. The, the uh, impact that a massive loss of construction workers would have on an economy would be crushing to their economy. Not to mention all of the, the uh, horrible things that have happened to them in their nation up to this point. And so, so now he's rethinking the plan. Like, how are we going to build stuff if we don't have people to build stuff? How are we going to maintain our fortifications? How are we going to build our massive pyramids and all of the other things we need if we don't have a workforce? So they're starting to rethink that. Not only that, but these people have stolen. Like, they've taken all their stuff. They took all their money when they left. So they're, and now they're wandering around aimlessly in this wilderness. And not only that, but you also have to keep in mind that if you remember back in the very beginning of the story, Pharaoh was worried that the people of Israel might join their enemies and attack them and destroy them. So if you're a powerful king with 
military stationed throughout your land and a border that you're trying to secure and you've got a big uncontrolled group of people who are now your enemies because of what you've put them through just wandering around a potential internal army to fight against you the people in egypt rationally would think we've got to do something to deal with this situation we can't just let these people wander around and, and they clearly don't know where they're going because they're wandering out into the middle of the desert there's nowhere for them to go there's nothing there and now they're stuck by the sea and they're just camping. So Pharaoh thinks all of this and then he thinks maybe their God is like our gods. Because, you know, we do all these things to appease our gods and sometimes it looks like it works, but sometimes our gods don't really listen to our prayers. And sometimes our gods don't really help us. They're kind of fickle. We don't really know what does and doesn't please the gods. So maybe, I mean, all that stuff that happened to us was pretty bad, but maybe their God changed his mind because, I mean, they're wandering the wilderness right now. They're, they're aimless. They have no leader. Like, what is, what is going on? Let's go take him back or kill him. One or the other. We're not really sure of the intentions. He's either trying to kill them because they are a potential threat or he wants to bring them all back to force them back into labor. So you can kind of understand how this works. And when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, it's not that God is forcing Pharaoh to do something sinful. He's making Pharaoh get back to his old ways of plotting and planning and thinking like a sinful ruler who's only out for his own benefit and, and the growth and expansion of his kingdom. So Pharaoh's heart starts to go back there. And Pharaoh doesn't know God, and he doesn't understand God, and he doesn't understand that God is faithful to his people. So he says, let's give it another shot. We'll get these people back. And as he does this, we see that he goes out and he corners people. But we know from reading the story at the beginning that this is a setup, a big setup. And God is setting this situation up for his glory, just like he sets up all things for his glory. So we've seen the setup. Now, in this next, sexu- uh, in, in this, this ne- next section, we see the security that God provides. So if you didn't notice, I'm going with the setup security, and then my final point will be salvation. So I'm going for as many preaching points as possible with three S's to help you remember. So the security. Look at verses 10 through 20 with me. It says, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord, And they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and it stood behind them coming between the hosts of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Israel sees the Egyptians, and immediately they lose their faith again. They've seen what God can do, but I think they also think that maybe this God is just like one of those other gods of Egypt. His plan isn't working. He's lost control. And now they're incredibly vulnerable in the wilderness. So they're afraid. We do hear that they cry out to the Lord, but then they immediately turn on Moses and start what they had started previously, accusing him, 
saying this was a bad idea. We didn't want this. We weren't that unhappy. And then they start doing this revisionist history in their mind saying it was, it was, it was better back then, right? I mean, they weren't actually coming. I mean, they were trying to kill our kids, but they weren't really killing us. We could work. I mean, it, it was horrible. It was slavery. But, I mean, at least we were alive. I mean, shouldn't we stay? Should we go back? What are we doing here? Why is the God, why has God abandoned us? And then, if you notice, they complain to Moses, and then the irony here is they say, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you've brought us out here to die? And I think the irony is, is that e- Egypt is probably most well-known for its massive, elaborate pyramid graves. Of all places in the world, these people... I don't know if they meant it as a joke, but said, whoa, whoa there weren't graves there. Now we've got we to gotta die out here in the wilderness. And they're scared. And they want to go back. And they keep telling themselves that things were better back then. They're tempted. They face opposition again. And they want to turn back. They're not trusting the Lord. They're not trusting what he's done. And they want to give in. Do you ever experience temptation or difficulty in your Christian walk and experience a temptation to give up, to just go back? God freed you if you're a believer. But sometimes it doesn't seem great. It doesn't seem like you're free. Maybe it, you escaped a sin, but it comes back in, in the form of some temptation, and you just want to want to go back in, and you, you can tell yourself, oh no, it, was, it, it really wasn't that bad. In fact, things were better then. Or in your relationships and in your marriages, you've made a commitment, you know what God wants you to do, and yet you think, I think it'd be better if I wasn't in this situation anymore. I don't think it's what God wants, but it's definitely what I want. And do you we can do that. We can experience that temptation and want to go back and want to give up. And so as the people are panicking and losing their faith, the Lord has to secure them. And he provides that security. And we see in this passage that he secures them in two ways. First, in this section, 10 through 20, we see that he secures his people with his word. And the next, he secures his people, by his power. If you look at Moses in this story also, it shows you that there is hope when you experience that kind of temptation, when you want to give up. Because Moses, if you remember, wanted to give up already, previously. He, he, didn't, he didn't like the plan from the beginning. And then he got an opportunity to do it, and there was all that excitement, and then opposition came, and he immediately turned to God and said, what's going on? Like, Let's give up. Let's, let's abort mission. And God had to remind him that he was there and he was going to be successful and that God was going to bless this endeavor. And here we see that that Moses has matured and he's seen God work in his life and he's seen God work enough and he's heard God's word and he's seen him work such that he can now be the one who actually like preaches the message back to the people. And he's encouraging them and saying, no, don't give up. God uses his word through Moses to tell the people, don't go surrender. Wait. Let God do something. You see that in verses 13 and 14. Probably the most encouraging little sermon thing we get in this passage. Moses says, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be quiet. Just shut up. Be quiet. Let God do his thing. Don't panic. Don't make bad decisions immediately. Wait. Endure. There's, uh, I I recently heard a pastor say that something to the effect of, uh, if you have a problem as a believer, if you're a child of God, when you have a problem, it's not really your problem. It's actually God's problem. And so when that problem, that temptation comes to you, you don't panic and get anxious and try to figure out how to work your way out of it alone. First, you go to God and you trust God. He's your father. It's his problem. He said he's going to save you. He'll do it. 
It doesn't mean we don't do anything. We don't fight temptation. We don't try. We don't come up with solutions to issues that we face in our life. But, but we don't let it control us, and we don't let it cause us to walk away and give up. So he tells them, don't be afraid. Stand up. You'll see the salvation of the Lord. He's going to fight for you. Be quiet. Because as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, if God is for us, we sang it today. What? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can actually be against us? And then the next thing, if you look at this in verse 15, the next thing that Moses, well, the Lord tells Moses to say. He says in the second half of 15, tell the people of Israel to go forward. Keep going. That's the one thing you can do is keep going. And in this situation, he literally meant walk forward. Don't give up. You're going to walk somewhere that doesn't look like there's a path right now. And then the next thing we see is not only does God secure, he doesn't pr- just provide security through his word, but he actually does stuff powerfully. He secures people by his power. So he solves their problem. He tells them, stand here, start walking forward. Why? Because I'm going to do something you've never seen before and you'll probably never see again in this way. I'm going to somehow blow, and we don't really understand this, and I can't really envision this, but like he blows enough that somehow the sea parts and miraculously it separates, such that there's a clear peninsula of, or I guess an isthmus maybe, of dry land in the middle of a body of water that they can just walk right through. And they start walking. And God also solves their problem, not only by, by doing that, but then he sends the pillar down in between them and their enemies so that they can't start assaulting them from behind as they're slowly walking through. So he physically secures them and protects them and then physically opens a path for them to walk through where there was no path before. Like amazing. And again, trying to envision what exactly this looked like, how it worked, What we do know is that it's the middle of the night, it's dark, the Egyptians and the people of Israel probably can't see, and now there's this crazy storm thing in between them, and so the Egyptians are kind of like waiting it out. And they don't know what's going on, and the Israelites were told to be quiet, so they're quietly walking through this patch of dry ground, and God is powerfully working. He's separating his sheep from the goats that are trying to get them. And... We're also told, while we're talking about Romans 8, and since we sang about it this morning, we're told, who shall separate us from the love of God? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has worked and he's provided salvation. He's secured his people. He isn't leaving them. Nothing will separate him from them. So he's set this whole thing up and he set it up for his own glory by securing his people. Next, we see in the next section of this passage, in 21 to 31, that the Lord also provides salvation. So we've seen the setup, we've seen the security, and now we see the salvation. Please read it with me, starting in 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the water being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, and all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watching, uh, in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces, and he threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us free, flee from before the Lord, or from, sorry, from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, 
and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. And the waters turned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What a salvation. The Lord tells Moses, after he's done this, this crazy thing and he's separated it, or, or sorry, in order to do it, lift up your hand. And, and we're, it's likely that he's using the same hand that he's been using all along with the staff to do all the miracles. And he lifts it up as a sign that this isn't just a weird fluke thing that happened. Like God is in control and through his human servant, he is accomplishing something powerful here. And right where he holds it up, wind, the sea kind of dries out, all the water gets pushed back. They're able to walk through on dry ground. It says here again that the sea is like a wall on either side of them. And again, I, you get the, the imagery of like uh, as a kid or from the movies of the big towering wall. And I, it's not necessarily saying that the sea, like you don't have to literally take it as the sea being physically a wall. I think what, what the author is getting at here is that that sea functioned as a wall of protection for them. So even if it was just what we would imagine is like a shore and it looked like a, a, a dry path of land, the Egyptians couldn't ride with their chariots around from the side. Like the cloud was, was protecting them on the back. But if, if they tried to come in and ambush them from the side, they couldn't. You can't drive a chariot or anything through the middle of water. And so as they're walking through this, being protected from behind by God in the cloud and then protected on both sides by the water, Pharaoh's army begins to pursue them. And again, we don't know. It doesn't say exactly how, but somehow the fog clears or the cloud moves far enough or maybe it moves all at one time and they realize there's a path and they think, oh, we've got to bring these people. Pharaoh commanded us to. And, and we don't know for sure if Pharaoh actually went in the water or not. It doesn't, we don't even know if his whole army went in. All we know is that everyone who did go in drown. Right? So if you, if you read it, they, they all see it. And for whatever reason, they all decide, oh, there's a path. We better, th they're going to escape. Like they, they found a way out of here. Let's hurry up and pursue them. But keep in mind, it's also in the middle of the night. And we're told that this is in the morning watch, which is the latest time of night when it's the darkest, not long before the dawn's going to begin to appear. And so this would have been the perfect time back then. And this was the most common time that like one enemy force, if they were going to make a surprise attack on another force, would do it right here, when they're all tired or asleep or very dark, we'll sneak up on them and we're going to ambush. And when they think they're going to ambush, they actually start chasing them down this really long, weird stretch of land in the middle of water on both sides, not knowing what's going on, likely. And while they're chasing, the Israelites have made it safely to the other side, walked all the way through. And then God causes a panic among the Egyptians, probably because they start realizing something's really weird going on, what, what, you, what they thought was like a dry patch of land is going to be like the silty, sandy, dirty bottoms. It's really hard. The horses can't pull the chariots through. They're starting to sink. And then there's maybe some sort of supernatural panic. Something happens. The tires start breaking. They can't get through. And they realize something really weird is happening here. We, we can't do this. And they realize that God, they, did you see that? They actually confessed that the Lord was the one fighting against them. So they realized that what they had assumed up to this point, that the Lord was kind of gone and done, they realized, no, he's still here and he's still protecting his people. And so they start to panic and they want to flee and they want to turn around. And then right as the dawn starts to come and they're probably able to see what's going on a little bit better now, the Lord tells Moses, put up your staff. Do it again, except this time we're going we're gonna to unseparate it. And so you imagine this water that's piled back for who knows how long, suddenly released with these people trying to get out, just wham, like a massive, powerful, I mean, if you've ever seen like a, a dam release, the, ca the catastrophic force of, of just water that's been held back releasing with a patch of an army right in the middle. They tried to escape and they couldn't. 
And I bet you the Israelites probably didn't even know what was going on in a lot of this. It was, it was probably a little too extreme, amazing, and it was very dark. They were just following Moses through the water. But when they woke up in the morning, or I guess they were awake, but when, when the sun came out and they could see what was happening, and after a little while, when all the bodies started to get bloated and float and wash onto the shore, they knew what happened. It says they saw their enemy's destruction. And they knew what God had done. And they believed in him. And they feared the Lord. And they believed God. And they believed in his servant Moses. So the Lord set all of this up. And he set it up to glorify himself. He set it up to secure his people and save them through judgment. He saves his people and he judges his enemies and those who want to harm them. The Lord sets up all things like this. He does everything for his glory and to secure his people in salvation through judgment. This is a trend. This is a pattern throughout the whole Bible. You'll see this. There's never salvation without judgment in the Bible. If you want to think of, as Christians, the most important salvation through judgment that God set up for us, we just looked at Jesus. And that mastermind change, the setup that God did. If you look with me, um, the book of Acts, chapter 4, we're told that with the, Israelite, or, or the, the church is starting to experience persecution. And so they pray to God, and they acknowledge this. They say that in this city, that is in Jerusalem, there were gathered together. So I'm, in, I'm starting in verse 27. There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had pre- predestined to take place. What happened with Jesus was similar to this. God worked it all out. It was the perfect setup. Right when the enemy thought they'd won, when they had killed the Son of God, he dies. And then shortly thereafter, a few days later, he's he's raised to newness of life, never to die again. And we're told that those of us who believe in Jesus in the same way, if we see that, We see the power of God through raising his son. We can be saved. Why? Because there was actual judgment that happened on the cross. It wasn't just a sad situation that happened as a result of a misunderstanding. The people misunderstood. Just like Pharaoh's heart was hardened, the people's hearts were hardened. They wanted to kill Jesus. And it wasn't because they knew that a sacrifice was needed for the sins of all the people in the world. It was because they wanted to get rid of him as their enemy. And yet God set it up in such a way that when they did that, he was saving his people. So that he was taking the punishment and the judgment that was supposed to go upon his people, and he was providing security through that judgment and giving them salvation. And the beautiful thing here is that we see in this picture of them going through the water, this judgment of death and life. And in the Bible, the Bible uses this as a theme. When John came baptizing, and then when Jesus kind of adopts this, and then the New Testament authors start talking about like what baptism is, we are told that we are buried with Christ in baptism. This is Colossians chapter 2. He says, in which you are raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So this water, when they went through it, Paul even uses the language that they all were baptized into God through this sea. And if if we trust in Jesus and receive that baptism, what, what happens to us is like the Israelites, we've passed through that water, but the water represents the death and the resurrection of Jesus so that we can actually have life. We've died with him, so we live with him if we're believers, and he saves us. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 3, he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him 
by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. God saves his people through salvation that he provides through judgment. And in this passage, we've seen over and over again up to this point in the story and now here through this this amazing story that, that God sets up all things for his glory. And he is glorified when he secures his people. He saves them and he judges others. So please pray with me as we think about this. Father, we praise you for your salvation. We praise you that just like the Egyptians and the Israelites many years ago, you have provided salvation to us through Jesus. We thank you that you set all of this up for your glory. We thank you that that you secure us through your word proclaimed and heard and through the power of your salvation working in our hearts by your spirit. And that one day you will save us fully, completely, bodily, from all death when Christ returns. Lord, we pray, come Lord Jesus. And we pray that in the meantime that you would strengthen us, that we would not be faithless like the Israelites were. I pray that we would hear your word, that we would trust you, and that we would endure and continue to move forward. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing one last song.